just introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Tosin Adaimo. I'm saying a big thank you for you know being part of this um, RICOM project and being you know always available to you know um, to teach and to support us. So um, Dr. Tosin Adaimo is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist devoted to improving the health and well-being of women around the world. She was born and raised in Ibadan, Oyo State, Nigeria. She graduated with bachelor's of science degree in biomedical engineering from Rutgers University, New Jersey. She earned her MD degree from Yale School of Medicine, New Haven, Connecticut, USA. She also completed her residency in training in obstetrics and gynecology at Harvard, at Harvard in Boston, Massachusetts, in USA, where she is a recipient of multiple teaching awards. In 2020, she completed her Master's of Public Health degree at the Yale School of Public Health, New Haven, Connecticut. She is also she is currently an assistant professor at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences at Yale University, New Haven, Connecticut, USA. Dr. Daimo is passionate about addressing women's health and health disparities in the community and global setting through research. Through research, education, and provision of clinical care, she provides education and capacity building training to help workers in local and global settings. She has, en she has engaged in research, teaching, and clinical care in many parts of the world, including Nigeria and Senegal. Nigeria, Senegal, Uganda, and the United States. So we're going to go ahead and um, launch the pre-quiz. Please um, feel free to, you know, we're not using this information for anything. Just feel free to um, answer the question. So the quiz has been launched. Um, this, in, this information is just to assess, you know, um, prior knowledge. You know, it's not a test. So feel free to answer. It's just to help us with our data. Okay, so we're two minutes in, um, two minutes, 30 seconds into the pre-quiz. We can do one more minute and then we'll, um, we'll end the poll. Thank you.
Okay, so um, for the people that just joined in late, we have one more minute to go and then we'll end the poll questions. Thank you. Okay, um, can we end the poll questions? I believe everyone should have answered the questions by now. There's one more question that will be shared on the slide. Um, please feel free to um, you know, put in your answers on the chat box. Like I said, it's not like, um, like an examination or anything like that. You know, it's, it's just to, um, it's for data purposes, just for us to get, you know, um, assess knowledge, knowledge gain. Okay, so we can have this question running for one minute and then the next question for one minute and then we can, we can move over to the session, if that would be. Um, you, can, you can answer, put in your answers in the chat box. So we're on the second question right now. So another one minute for this question and then um, we move over to the session. Okay, I think that we should be done by now. Um, okay. So can we end the poll questions and then move over to the session? Okay, over to you, Dr. Daymore. Thank you, Chaguze, for your Great introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. It is an honor and a privilege for me to be here with you this afternoon to talk to you about evaluation and management of abnormal uterine bleeding. My hope is that this session would be uh, a review for many of us and also a time for us to um, ask questions and discuss at the very end. Please feel free to stop me at any point if there is something you would like me to clarify. I hope this will be also interactive. And like was mentioned earlier, if you can turn on your screens during the discussion session, that would be really great. The goal of today is to provide an overview 
of abnormal uterine bleeding and also uh, go over initial evaluation and then focus, we're gonna focus a lot of time on the FIGO system of the palm coin system of classification developed by FIGO and then go over how to manage acute heavy bleeding. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. So starting out, what is abnormal uterine bleeding? Um, and sort of how common is it? So like most of us know, abnormal uterine bleeding is a common gynecologic complaint. And it's broadly defined as when um, a person has bleeding that goes away or deviates from the normal parameters of the volume of the, of the blood, the duration of the bleeding, um, the regularity or frequency um, of, of menses or the bleeding. And the abnormal uterine bleeding classification was developed by the International Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2011 to move us away from older terminology used to describe abnormal bleeding. And um, so um, in the past, many of us, and some of us probably still now, still are used to using terms like um, menorrhagia to describe you know, heavy bleeding, no oligomenorrhea, which described, which is, describes uh, less frequent bleeding less frequent bleeding, no metrorrhagia or dysfunctional uterine bleeding. So all those terms are actually um, older terms that um, the hope is that we would use abnormal uterine bleeding as a new term to describe these. And as we're gonna go into more detail during this talk, how to then classify the actual abnormal uterine bleeding that you're referring to when describing a patient's condition. So let's just start with the the FIGO system on classification. So this is the classification for abnormal uterine bleeding developed by FIGO that is based on the parameters of the bleeding. And so the parameters that um, are important are the frequency. So you can see here that normal frequency is where um, there's a menstrual cycle between um, that occurs every 24 to 38 days. And so when you have somebody who has a menstrual cycle um, doesn't have as less frequent bleeding, um, less than you know every 24 days, or then you call that amenorrhea, or when it's infrequent, um, every 30 greater than every 38 days, you call that that also classifies that as an abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, also looking at duration, um, you know most periods should last. On average, people usually bleed from, for three to five days, but eight days is the upper limit of where above that, you then um, go into prolonged bleeding that could be termed as being abnormal. Also, the regularity also matters in the terminology. So, you know, most people have a cycle, you know, every month, you know, every you know, 24 to 38 days cycle. Um, but then there could be variations in the, in the cycle, right? Some people, you know, instead of having a period every 28 days, Maybe some days is, is 28 days apart, sometimes it's you know, 31 days apart, and it's okay to have those slight variations between the shortest to longest cycle. But when those, that variation is more than 10 days, then you also, that also uh, falls under the category of abnormal urine bleeding. The flow, the volume of the blood um, is part of the uh, parameters that we, that's used for definition. So, and it's based on really what the patient considers as being normal. So any bleeding that, that deviates from what the patient thinks is normal, whether it's lighter or heavier, is also could be termed as being abnormal. And then lastly, the, um, if there's intramenstrual bleeding, um, it's never normal to have instrumental bleeding. So anytime that that happens either randomly or in a cyclic like predictable ma ma manner, either you know, in the middle of the cycle, early in the cycle or late in the cycle, that is also um, termed as being abnormal uterine bleeding. Now, that was the, that's the FIGO system one classification. There is the FIGO system two classification for abnormal uterine bleeding. And that is actually where we're gonna spend most of our time on this talk today. Um, but an initial introduction is this classification is actually based on the, um, the causes, the potential causes of the abnormal uterine bleeding. And the, the system groups causes into two big categories, either structural or um, due to um, non-structural causes. Um, and so the palm, as you can see, the palm is an, the analogy for this. 
um, consist of structure and um, causes that could be due to either polyp, adenomyosis, like a myoma, or fibroids, or malignancy and hyperplasia. That's the palm. And then you have the non structural causes, that's the coin part. And um, this is where you have coagulopathy, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial, iatrogenic, or not yet classified. And like I said, we're going to go into this in more detail. But moving on, just in terms of initial evaluation for a, a patient who has abnormal urine bleeding, you always want to start by assessing the hemodynamic stability. Is this a person who is stable? Are they having so much bleeding where you know, um, they are becoming um, you know, hypotensive, they're losing a huge amount of their intravascular volume? Or is this somebody who is not stable where you can take your time to evaluate? Or is this someone who is really stable where you actually have to escalate the care that they get um, in order to, um, to stabilize them? Um, and also just keeping in mind that when thinking about abnormal urine bleeding for any woman of reproductive age, it's always very important to rule out pregnancy. And so going over the initial evaluation, it starts with a history that we all take, assessing the menstrual history and pattern, asking the questions that we talked about earlier, we would ask the frequency, um, the regu um, regularity, um, volume, et cetera, the obstetric and gynecologic history, issue of contraception, uh, for example, are they currently on contraception or are they not, which could also clue you into whether or not this bleeding is due to pregnancy, any medical conditions that actually could um, sort of exacerbate the bleeding or actually put the patient at, at higher risk. So for example, um, a person who has um, abnormal urine bleeding and also has a history of you know, hypertension and diabetes and obesity, and we'll talk about this later in detail, but that actually, you know, depending on what their age is, those medical conditions increase their risk of having a malignancy. And so you wanna get a detailed medical history. Also considering bleeding disorders, because people actually could have, um, bleeding disorders could actually manifest as abnormal uterine bleeding um, and disorders such as um, that, that, that are, disorders that impact the body's ability to clot, so form clots, for example, like von Willebrand's um, factor this disease. And then medications that they're on, um, there was a question in the pre-quiz about a person being on a medication called like aspirin that, yeah, potentially could actually, you know, you know, sort of um, impact bleeding profile or even more, more, more significantly, um, blood thinners like Lovenox or, or Warfarin. So you want to know what they're on. And then endocrine disorders, um, such as, you know, that could impact the bleeding pattern. And then you want to go to your physical examination and just keep in mind that you want to be very thorough in your physical examination and also consider alternative sources of bleeding because it may not just be from the vagina, it may be from the rectum, it could be from the bladder, it could be from a urinary source. And so you want to be comprehensive in your evaluation. So um, when it comes to the laboratory values, it actually, the, oh, the laboratory test to get, it actually depends on you know, your judgment as a clinician. It depends on the history that you get. It depends on the patient's um, hemodynamic stability, how, you know, their clinical status. And uh, definitely for anybody, any woman who is a reproductive age, you wanna get a pregnancy test without pregnancy. But then you, know, you could decide to get a complete blood cell count so you can get a sense of what the hematocrit is, what the platelet is, depending on your know, volume of the bleeding, or you can decide to hold off on that if the bleeding doesn't seem to be so heavy. Um, also considering endocrine abnormalities that could be contributing to the uh, abnormal uterine bleeding, such as um, checking uh, TSA to check for um, hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. Um, also targeted screening for blood disorders, if based on your history, you have a higher suspicion for that. Keeping in mind infectious causes like chlamydia, you may want to test for that based on the risk factors and the history that you get on your exam. And also based on also, you know, the history and the, the clinical status, whether or not you want to uh, assess for disorders of hemostasis, in particular, if you're worried that the patient is going into DIC, disseminated in intravascular coagulation, and they're in a really, really heavy bleeding or, or prolonged heavy bleeding. Then next is imaging. Um, for abnormal urine bleeding, I would say the go-to imaging that we all know is your transvaginal ultrasound, which is uh, the first line. And you know, we, if possible, um, based on the age of the patient, of the patient, you want to get a transvaginal um, ultrasound so that way you actually have better visualization of the adnexa, the uterus, and the pelvic structures. Um, and then other 
modalities, imaging modalities to consider include um, sonohistogram or sitting infusion sonography, also known as SIS, which allows you to actually really um, assess the structure, the architecture, the structural architecture of the endometrial cavity and could help to um, really clearly define um, lesions within the endometrium and more to come on that. Another imaging modality or rather diagnostic modality is the, hysteros is the hysteroscopy, um, a diagnostic hysteroscopy. Uh, there's a picture of what that would look like here um, where you basically take a, you know, a hysteroscopic camera to take a look into the cavity um, to assess. And this is also, this is a second line um, um, tool that you would use. And then MRI also, the pelvic, the pelvic MRI also is a second line agent that you'd consider. But in summary for this slide, the, the pelvic ultrasound is the first, should be the first line for evaluation for abnormal uterine bleeding. So um, I mentioned the, the palm coin system and um, we're gonna to start to focus on that. So like I said, the goal is to, although FIGO's goal and the goal is to think of abnormal uterine bleeding in terms of the etiology. And so the palm coin system, you have, um, you know, you have structural etiologies and then based on what it is, you put the hyphen next to the abnormal uterine bleeding. So for example, if it's a polyp, it's AUB hyphen P, if it's adenomyosis, AUB hyphen A, on and on. So you have the structural and you have the non-structural. So we're gonna start with the structural causes and causes first. So the P, which stands for polyp in the palm coin AUBP, um, is basically when you have, have overgrowth, hyperplastic overgrowth of the endometrial glands and stroma. And usually that overgrowth um, occurs around a, a vessel, a vascular core, like the vessel that feeds that overgrowth. Um, and most people present with intramenstrual bleeding, so bleeding in between their periods, in between their, in their, their menses um, or spotting. That's like a hallmark of, um, of, 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 of how a polyp presents in most patients. And the diagnosis will be made with the use of a pelvic ultrasound. Um, you could also consider a sonohistogram as a second line evaluation um, if the pelvic ultrasound is sort of not clear. Um, the prognosis is typically very good for a polyp is because they are typically benign. Um, and however, there are um, times where um, um, you would want to rule out concern for malignancy or hyperplasia. Um, and then going to the management, the management is it actually depends on um, the presentation, the patient's age, and also their risk factors. So the two things you can do if a patient has a polyp is to consider expected management. So basically that's not doing anything and just waiting versus um, a hysteroscopy polypectomy. So that's where you actually perform directed visualization of the polyp in the endometrial cavity with a hysteroscopy. And then you do perform a polypectomy when you take it out. Now, how, what, how, what you do depends on a couple of factors, including the patient's preference. And so uh, a polyp in any postmenopausal woman should be removed. Um, and that is because um, even though polyps are most likely to be benign, postmenopausal women are more likely to have a polyp that's malignant, that's cancer, compared to a woman who is, who is not postmenopausal. And so any postmenopausal woman with a polyp um, should have the polyp removed. That that would be the recommendation, just to you know rule out the very low the, the, the rule out the chance that it could be um, a malignancy. Also, um, it, uh, so even for somebody who is not postmenopausal, somebody who is reproductive age, if they have a polyp that they are persistently symptomatic um, from, where they continue to have abnormal uterine bleeding, like you know, either heavier or um, spotting. If they're symptomatic, you would also um, would also recommend that it gets removed. Now, if the, if the patient is not symptomatic and if she's premenopausal and if she doesn't have risk factors for hyperplasia or which or cancer, and if she desires not to undergo surgical removal, that is reasonable with a plan that you would continue to watch. But um, just to summarize the management of polyps, you would definitely want to remove it when if it's in a postmenopausal woman or if a woman actually has risk factors for hyperplasia. Those risk factors include, um, you know, obesity, a person who is on hormone replacement therapy, a person who um, is sort of as a high risk or has been exposed to a lot of unopposed un 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 um, 
estrogen because that increases the risk of hyperplasia as well. And so that also falls into anyone who is, you know, has a high BMI. Um, and then there's some thought about how the size of the polyp may be correlated with the risk of malignancy where if it's a polyp that's greater than 1.5 centimeter, you probably would want to remove it because there might be a higher chance of malignancy. The data on that is, is not really clear, um, but the main thing is postmenopausal remove it. Um, premenopausal, if they're symptomatic, remove it. If not, the patient has the option to either wait or, or have it removed. Um, so next, um, oh, just to show you, this is a picture of what a polyp will look like on your sonohist. So um, the sonohist is pretty much an ultrasound, but then while the ultrasound is being done, fluid, um, typically normal saline, is injected into the endometrial cavity through the cervix. And so this distends the endometrium, and then you can actually have really good visualization of the endometrial cavity. So in this picture you can see here, this is a polyp, and you can see that this this um, highlighted, this um, Doppler flow shows the vessel that is feeding this polyp. Um, so this is a classic presentation of a polyp, but you can also diagnose this just on routine pelvic ultrasound where you can place Doppler over the ultrasound, over the endometrium to highlight also this um, vascular core. So next is the A part of the palm coin system. Um, and so that, and that stands for adenomyosis. And adenom adenomyosis stands for uh, uh, is characterized by when you have glands and glands and stroma that should be in the endometrium, that should be in the lining, but instead actually are then also in the myometrium. And in these causes, the, the, the myometrium um, to hypertrophy, to, um, you know, to get bigger. And most people present with um, heavy uterine bleeding, every, menstru every menstrual bleeding, um, also painful periods or even chronic pelvic pain. And the diagnosis actually could be pretty tricky because it's, you know, it's a clinical diagnosis where it really is based on pathology. It's only when you have the, you know, the, the uterus, right, that you can actually say 100% that the person has adenomyosis. However, there are things that we do clinically based on, ultras based on an ultrasound or an MRI that could be suggestive of adenomyosis. And um, the prognosis is usually benign. It's not, as, it's not associated with malignancy. Um, and the management also depends, really depends on the patient's symptoms. You could decide to go with expectant management where you just, you know, if the symptoms are not as bothersome for the patient, you just wait and watch. You could decide to, um, to provide medical management with um, hormonal contraception um, that could actually help to alleviate some of the symptoms of the heavy bleeding or the symptoms of the painful periods or even the pelvic pain. And then lastly, you could consider surgical management with the use of uterine ablation, that's where you basically, um, you know, for lack of a better one, burn the inner lining of the, of the uterus, the endometrial lining, um, or a hysterectomy, which is definitely treatment. And there are no really clear red flags when it comes to adenomyosis that I can think about. And this is a picture of what adenomyosis, you know, may look like an ultrasound. So um, this is, this is a, a sagittal image of sagittal image of the uterus. And um, some things that could be suggestive on ultrasound is that you might, you would see sort of asymmetric um, thickening of the uterus. So this is the posterior and this is the anterior. This is the uterine lining, as you can see. So you can see that the posterior part of the uterus is actually thicker than the anterior part over here. And that could be suggestive of adenomyosis on ultrasound. Going over to, um, and then here you also see sort of like echoes that like you have, um, uh, alternating echoes of bright and dark and dark images on the ultrasound that could also potentially be suggestive. Now going over to the MRI, um, this is a uterus as you can see, also a sagittal image, and you can also see that on an MRI you have thickening of the posterior uterus, much more thickened compared to the anterior part of the uterus. This one thickening is the initial lining. Another tool that is sometimes used by radiologists on MRI is to get a sense of the thickness of the junctional zone. So that is the zone between the endometrium and the myometrium. And if it's thick, perhaps above 12, 12 millimeters, it could be suggestive of adenomyosis. But like I mentioned earlier, the diagnosis is, um, is clinical and it's only confirmed with pathology if a patient decides to go ahead to have a hysterectomy. And most patients, that have adenomyosis don't because usually you're able to control the symptoms with less invasive um, um, methods. 
So then going over to the L, which is in biomyoma, which many of us are very familiar with because, you know, unfortunately, um, Black women are actually more likely to have uh, as a higher incidence of, of fibroid um, myoma in, in, in the Black population. Um, and um, fibroids are caused by monoclonal, when there's a proliferation of monoclonal, uh, beta monoclonal tumors that occur in the smooth muscle. So basically you just have benign proliferation of the smooth muscle of the myometrium. And the hallmark for um, leiomyoma or fibroids is you know, heavy or prolonged menses, bulk symptoms where the uterus is pressing on either the, the bowel causing constipation or the bladder causing pressure or, ur or urinary symptom. But also um, it could also cause issues with reproductive, reproductive it could also, it also cause reproductive dysfunction um, in particular infertility. The diagnosis um, is made by ultrasound, but you could also employ a similar histogram. Fibroids are mostly benign. Um, thankfully, um, there is a very rare chance of sarcoma um, that um, where fibroid could develop into a sarcoma, and that's very rare. Um, data in the United States, um, which could potentially extrapolate, and it's very rare where sarcoma occurs in three to seven out of a hundred thousand. So that's really rare, um, and because it's most likely benign, the management actually really depends on. Um, the symptoms and also the goals. And you could decide to undergo expectant management versus medical management with hormonal therapy versus surgical management with um, myomectomy, which is removal of just the fibroids or hysterectomy. And um, you know, really, as I tell my patients, you know, most people, most women, you know, up to 80% of, seven to 80% of women will actually have fibroids during their lifetime. And so how you manage it depends on whether or not the fibroids are causing symptoms um, such as abnormal uterine bleeding or box symptoms, or if it's thought that it actually is impacting, you know, fertility. Um, also, you know, birth control pills such as, you know, birth, uh, you know, combined estrogen progesterone or progestin therapy could also be used to manage some of the abnormal uterine bleeding symptoms that uh, could occur in the setting of fibroids. Red flags would in, um, for fibroids would include if there's a rapidly enhancing mass of fibroid in a premenopausal patient, that could be a red flag. But even then, you know, it's not very clear that that means that it's a, it's a tumor. Um, many times it still ends up being benign. So moving on uh, to a little bit more about fibroids, as we know, fibroids could occur in different places and you would, you would um, define or you can characterize fibroids based on their location. So here in this picture, you see a submucosal fibroid. It's called submucosal because it's in the endometrial cavity. It's also pinocolated. It's sort of like a hanging food. You have an intramural fibroid that's within the myometrium. You have a subserosal fibroid that is basically between the serosal layer and the myometrium. And then you have your also pinocolated subserosal fibroid. And where the fibroid is also determines of how you manage it. So for example, if you have a fibroid that's purely submucosal, the management would be a hysteroscopic myomectomy where you go into the hysteroscope to remove it versus a fibroid that is intramural where the management would be potentially a myomectomy. So the surgical management would either be myomectomy or hysterectomy depending on the, on the symptoms and, um, other, and other factors. And as most of us also know, people actually also have multiple different kinds of fibroids in different places as well. You could have a submucosal one, an intramural one, etc. So um, moving on to the end part of the palm system, which is the malignancy or hyperplasia. Um, just give me a moment. Um, you have um, their risk, the risk factors for malignancy in a patient who has abnormal uterine bleeding are, are, are many. And I would say that um, includes increasing age. And so um, we know that women who are older, particularly between 50 to 70 years old, that are higher risk of malignancy if they have abnormal uterine bleeding compared to women who are younger. Um, also, when a woman has unopposed estrogen or tamoxifen, tamoxifen therapy, which is a medication that's used to treat breast cancer, um, early menarche, um, late menopause, nulliparity, chronic anovulation in the setting of polycystic ovarian syndrome, obesity, all these risk factors mm -hmm. increase the risk of of, um, of malignancy. And you can see a focus on, on obesity. Um, typically, endometrial cancer is defined as type 1 or type 2. And type 1 is usually the one that is, um, if we, if we think is, 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 is driven by, um, by unopposed estrogen as a risk factor. And so you can see here by the odds ratio that 
the higher the, the BMI, so going from being overweight to class one to class two to class three, the higher the, the, the incidence or the risk of, um, of endometrial cancer. And the risk is up to 7.1 in a person with class three obesity. Um, and then diabetes, um, family history, also genetic abnormalities such as Lynch syndrome or Haldane also increase the risk of malignancy. So if you have been doing, if you have been sleeping, if you have been, you know, working on your clinic notes in a patient, I would say this slide is a very, one of the probably the most important slides of this talk. And I will ask you to please pay attention um, to this. And so um, as you can see on this, um, if you're worried about if a person is at risk for endometrial cancer or hyperplasia, you would want to perform further evaluation in addition to imaging or labs in order to rule out endometrial cancer. But in what patients would you want to perform this additional evaluation on? So first of all, any postmenopausal patient who has any kind of bleeding, um, regardless of the volume, regardless of the, of the duration, even if it's spotted, even if it's staining, if they have bleeding, they should undergo evaluation for malignancy or hyperplasia. And that evaluation could be in the form of a pelvic ultrasound um, and or with an endometrial biopsy. Um, and on pelvic ultrasound, typically you would also, if there is concern for hyperplasia, right, which is also a reason to undergo, so uh, proceed with endometrial sampling to get a Sample of the intermetrial bleed, you would also want to um, perform evaluation to rule out endometrial cancer as well in them. For women who are younger than 45 years old, because they had lower risk for having endometrial cancer in the first place, um, you could consider endometrial, um, you could consider for the evaluation for endometrial cancer if they have risk factors for endometrial cancer. And those risk factors include having an elevated BMI, so obesity, so a BMI of 30 or above. Um, and um, also patients who have BMI less than 30, but who have persistent abnormal uterine bleeding, where even despite medical management, um, they continue to have abnormal uterine bleeding, or if they have, particularly if they have a history of chronic anovulation where they are not, they don't have regular periods. Um, you wanna go ahead and perform um, endometrial sampling to rule out endometrial cancer. And then um, if you see um, atypical glandular cells on the pap smear, um, in, um, in any patient who, um, if it's atypical in any patient or in the patient who is above 35, if you see any, um, you know, atypical glandular cells or also in somebody who is above 40, who you see endometrial cells on their pap smear or anybody who actually is no longer menstruating. So if a woman who is no longer menstruating should not have endometrial cells on her pap smear because technically the endometrial, the endometrium should be sort of, um, you know, latent right and so if they are endometrial cells that is that's a sign of shedding and that also then could be a sign that you want to you know that the patient could be at risk for hyperplasia or malignancy and so you want to go ahead and perform um, endometrial sampling in such a patient as well so um moving on just a quick word on endometrial sampling is something that's quite simple that can be done um, in the in in the office typically it's an office procedure where you use the pipe pill so this is a picture of a pipe pill what it looks like it's really a very a very thin um, plastic sort of catheter that you can insert through, into the endometrium to sample it um, to rule out um, endometrial hyperplasia or cancer and it actually is quite sensitive it has a detection rate of like nine percent in patients who are postmenopausal and at one percent in patients who are premenopausal so, um, and if you, if there's concern for malignancy, you should refer to a gynecologic oncologist um, for further evaluation. So going on to the other part of the palm coin system, um, when, excuse me, we went over the structural causes, not for the non-structural causes. Um, we're gonna start with the C, the coagulopathy. So um, coagulopathy, such as like any disorders that, it, that impact the most cases, could cause abnormal uterine bleeding. The very common one, a very common one is a von Willebrand disease where um, the protein called von Willebrand usually helps with clot formation um, when a person is bleeding. But when you have either 
low levels of that protein or the protein you have actually is not working well. If there's abnormality in that protein, um, that could produce, you know, that could be, uh, it could be due to von Willebrand disease and that's the definition for von Willebrand disease. Um, in terms of, you know, not everybody actually needs to undergo evaluation for von Willebrand disease or, uh, you know, disorders of homeostasis. And it really is based on your history that you get a sense of whether or not this is somebody you want to do that additional step of evaluation for. So questions you'd want to ask the patient who has um, heavy bleeding is to ask questions like, you know, have they ever had a history of postpartum hemorrhage? Have they really had a lot of like heavy bleeding with relatively minor surgery that they shouldn't have heavy bleeding for or in, only their blood transfusion for? Or have they had heavy bleeding with dental work? For example, like taking out a, 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 you know, a, a tooth extraction where they had really heavy bleeding more than you would expect. That could be a clue that this patient may actually have a, a, a bleeding disorder and you'd want to further evaluate that. Other symptoms that you could assess for in your history taking that could clue you to um, the risk of von Willebrand is if somebody has easy bruising where they bruise frequently, like twice or one or once or twice a month, or if they have you know bleeding from their nose, or they have gum bleeding, or if they have a family history of bleeding disorder, that would clue you to want to further evaluate for this. And Hello, Dr. Tosin, please, can you unmute? We can hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Moving on to the old part of the Cohen system, you have the ovulatory dysfunction. And as we all know, a menses, ovulation, it's all really controlled by an axis, the HPO axis, the hypothalamus in the brain, um, you know, secretes GnRH in a postal fashion that causes the pituitary also in the brain to the secret LH FSH that has um, that, that um, works on the cells in the ovary and then on and on. And so if you have any disorder in this pathway, either in the hypothalamus or in the pituitary or actually in the ovarian axis itself and the ovary itself, that could actually cause abnormalities and bleeding. And the common one is PCOS, um, which leads to chronic anovulation where a patient does not have regular periods every month. And the diagnosis of, and the hallmark is amenorrhea or irregular heavy bleeding. Um, in terms of the, you know, the diagnosis, um, it's based on laboratory abnormality and also particularly based on what you think is more likely to happen. So for PCOS, for example, like most of us know, you know, it's 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 also a clinical diagnosis that's based on, you know, the Rotterdam criteria where if a person has irregular bleeding, but also has signs of high estrogen, like erythritism, um, and also either based on ultrasound findings that could show polycystic ovaries that could be suggestive of PCOS if the patient meets two of the three criteria that's used to diagnose. Um, in terms of the management, you know, really it just, you manage it based on underlying symptoms. For somebody who has heavy bleeding, irregular heavy bleeding, you'd want to start them on you know, hormonal therapy, um, birth control pills, if there are no contraindications in order to um, regulate their bleeding. Um, but even more importantly, for people who have chronic anovulation, you want to be thinking about endometrial protection. Because when a patient is chronically anovulating, when a patient is chronically not having periods, that actually increases the risk of, you know, unopposed estrogen and increases the risk of endometrial cancer. So for patients with anovulatory dysfunction, putting them on um, a kind of progestin or combined hormonal contraception would help to reduce their risk of endometrial cancer in the long run. And going on to the, um, to the E is the endometrial factor. So this is basically any disturbances on the molecular or cellular, cellular level that oh, impacts the yeah. regulation of volume of blood and the menstruation. And typically this inflammatory or infectious causes like you know, chlamydia or endometritis. And the hallmark is also irregular bleeding or heavy bleeding. And the management depends on the underlying factor. And treatment of the underlying factor or the underlying infection if, if, if present. 
Then I for the current is the iatrogenic causes. This is the cause that's caused by, you know, the, you know, I guess you could say, you know, ask the medical team or an external cause, like for example, a medical device or medication, a patient who is on anticoagulation, for example, um, or a patient who's on medications like dopamine um, that impacts dopamine metabolism, particularly patients who are on like a certain antipsychotics and also those who um, an IUD. So that could actually impact cause abnormal urine bleeding. And of course, if you know that you place an IUD in a patient and she's having some spotting with that, usually that's overall, you know, you, you just, you know, you counsel about expectation management and particularly the patient is okay with it. Or you can decide to change the formulation of your contraception in order to help to, um, to improve the bleeding pattern. Um, and then the last is the N, which is the non-classified. So this is pretty much not yet classified category that just encapsulate other causes of abnormal uterine bleeding. And one of them would include um, a uterine scar defect or ismosil. So you can see from this diagram, this is a, a pelvic to the endometrial cavity. And right here, you can see uh, a defect in the, in the myometrium. You can see sort of like an analogous picture here on the gross imaging or the gross specimen. You see this cavity, uh, it's a uterine scar defect. And sometimes blood can then pull there and contribute to an uh, abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, and this is something that you, you could see in a patient who has a prior history of a C-section, um, the C-section scar defect. It's not common, thankfully, but it could be a cause of abnormal uterine bleeding. So um, wrapping this up, um, just this last slide that goes over how, what are the options, or second to last slide that goes over, what are the options for management of heavy bleeding in the patient who is immunodynamically stable? So um, even while you're trying to figure out what the potential causes could be, based on the palm coin etiology. If a patient has heavy bleeding, you would want to actually at least initially uh, manage that and, and stop that, right? And so your options could include your um, IV estrogen, um, and that's like a big gun that you, you can offer to patients. Um, and you can give the dose every four to six hours for 24 hours, and that typically should stop most abnormal bleeding, but there are contraindications to that and you should be aware of. And so patients who have a history of breast cancer, patients who have a history of a, a, a deep venous thrombosis or arterial thromboembolic, thromboembolic disease, they are actually at high risk of having a stroke um, or clot or pulmonary embolism if you give them high um, estrogen. So you want to avoid this medication in such patients. And also you would use it in caution in patients who have um, cardiovascular risk factors as well. Another option could be a combined oral contraceptive, which is actually more sort of more common. I would use where you would start the patient on a high dose, like sort of like a uh, a, a taper. You know, you, you start three times a day for seven days, and then you start to taper down. You would also avoid in in patients who have a history of smoking and who are 35 or above, because that increases their risk of having a clot. Um, you would um, also avoid the patients who have breast cancer, hypertension, DVT. Uh, migraines because anybody who has you know these this risk this this risk factors it could actually increase their risk of having a clot or a stroke or pulmonary embolus if they're exposed to estrogen. So for patients who, for example, have contraindications to estrogen, um, you know you would there's the option for using progestin therapy with medroxy medroxy progesterone acetate, so like Provera, that's the another name for it. And you could start at a high dose of three, 20 milligrams three times per day for seven days, and you can taper it down. Patients sometimes have a lot of nausea, as most of us know with this, and so you could also start at a lower dose or you know start at you know a lower frequency based on the on how heavy the bleeding is. Um, you would also want to use extra and um, progesterone with caution in patients who have an active um, pulmonary embolus or or. DVT or arterial thromboembolic disease, because if it's active or even in the recent past, it also still could put them at higher risk of having um, a clot. Um, but in general, progestin therapies are safer for these patient population compared to um, therapies that have estrogen in them. And then you have tranexamic acid, um, which actually sort of is an anti-fibrinolytic anti agent. It, it helps, it prevents the breakdown of, of um, fibrinogen, which you need to, to help stabilize and form clots. And you could um, go this IV and oral dose, as an IV and oral formulation for tranexamic acid. And you can give it up to every eight hours for up to five days. And also you will use in caution with people who have a current thromboembolic disease because there's also a risk that it could increase their risk of having um, 
uh, a clot. And other, um, other um, mm. things to consider, particularly in a patient who is unstable, where they're losing a lot of blood, they're under, hemodynamically unstable, is making sure you have a large bore IV in place um, in order to be able to resuscitate them, give them blood transfusion, give them IV fluids if needed. Um, consider a uterine curettage, a DNC, to, um, to stop really heavy bleeding, um, also depending on the etiology. Also consider a, a balloon tamponade. You could use a Foley, you could use a Cook, um, I mean, depending on, well, probably not a Cook if they are not gravid, it would probably be hard to fit a Cook balloon in there, but you could use a Foley balloon to tamponade the, the, the endometrial cavity and tamponade the uterus. High dose IV estrogen, like we mentioned, consider uterine artery embolization, which is done by our radiology colleagues, tranectomic acid, and if all things fail, if the patient is unstable, if the patient's life is at risk, a hysterectomy. And take home points is for this talk is be familiar with the FIGO classification of abnormal urine bleeding, particularly the system two classification using the palm coin method, and um, try to incorporate that in your documentation and your evaluation. And also be aware that any episode of postmenopausal bleeding in a patient should be evaluated regardless with either an ultrasound um, starting out with that and then potentially an endometrial, endometrial biopsy. But my go-to actually really is always an endometrial biopsy if possible, because in order to rule out endometrial cancer, it's always good to have a tissue specimen that's usually you know, more definitive or more, uh, potentially more sensitive. Also be aware of conditions that increase the risk of endometrial hyperplasia or cancer and be, be ready to perform further evaluation beyond ultrasound and you know, medical management if there is a risk, high risk factor for endometrial cancer. And lastly, management of an abnormal uterine bleeding, it all depends on you know, patient preferences, uh, the severity of the bleeding, obviously the resources that are also available um, to, to manage the, the, the bleeding. And these are my references, and I will stop there and open this up to any questions that people may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Demo. This was fantastic. I like the fact that you were very detailed in your presentation. So thank you. And then the floor is open for you know questions. So if you, you can chat your questions in, that's okay. And then we'll take it from the chat box. Okay. Hi, thank you Amo, for the lovely presentation. I wanted to ask, right? I noticed, um, in the management, um, you mentioned, um, you know, the uterine artery embolization and all of that. So I, is there a place for um, uterine artery ligation in severe cases of, you know, heavy menstrual bleeding? And then also, is there a place um, due to, you know, financial constraints in areas where we practice? Is there a place for, you know, use of NSAIDs for them, like the, you know, um, common NSAIDs that we can get off the, off the shelf. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, thank you, uh, excellent questions. I'll actually start with this. The second question you, you asked, so you're absolutely right. NSAIDs is part of the medical, medic, options for medical management that you could consider in a patient with heavy menses. And there's a lot of data that shows that, you know, ibuprofen NSAIDs like ibuprofen um, actually um, can reduce the volume um, of the bleeding. And so that's part of your, your tool in addition to your hormonal contraception if, um, if indicated. And then to your first question about uterine artery ligation. So absolutely, that is a surgical technique that is possible, but then to perform uterine artery ligation, I'm, you're gonna be, have to be in the operating room where you are either doing it laparoscopically or with an open or uh, with an open abdomen. So the uterine artery um, embolization is done through interventional radiology in places where there's high, where there's resources. So instead of actually having an incision in the belly through catheters, typically sometimes through the femoral catheter, through the groin, the 
they insert catheters into to get to the to the uterine artery and then they embolize it using um, some gel that a uh, form that could actually occlude blood flow to the uterus. But in the in a setting where you don't have access to that, because that actually is a high you know, resource, high intense um, and two, you could then consider surgical management. And perhaps if you go to the operating room, if the surgeon takes the patient to the operating room, they could decide to start with uterine artery ligation first before they go ahead to perform a hysterectomy if the patient is clinically stable and the surgeon thinks that that is the, you know, and it depends on the surgeon's judgment. So you're right. Urine artery ligation is a tool, but it's part of a, the surgical tool that can be decided upon in the operating room. Thank you so much. And then um, really very educating session and you made it really simplified. Sorry about the noise. Okay, so my second question is still on the management, right? Um, so um, you mentioned the hysteroscopic removal of fibroids. So at what um, size of a fibroid, say you try and size of the fibroid, should we not attempt um, a hysteroscopy? Say we've done a scan and we've seen, right? Yes, so yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And obviously these are questions that are, um, or these are decisions that are performed by, you know, wherever the, the, in the, by the surgeon and also based on patient preference. There is no, you know, there's no absolute size that you'd say based on this small size, you shouldn't go perform it. But a lot of it also really is based on the patient's symptoms. Like the patient is not symptomatic in any way. The patient is not having abnormal bleeding. If their periods are normal, if they're, if they're not so heavy, if they're not bothersome, I really don't go after some because of fibroids unless the patient is symptomatic. So it depends on the symptoms, regardless of the size. But most times, really small size fibroids, usually in my experience, don't really cause a lot of problems. And so if it's really small size and there's no symptom, then there's really no need to do anything about it. Unless obviously there's also other concerns for hyperplasia or malignancy. So one is the symptoms, like I said, but the second thing also is the sort of the change in size. If somebody also has a rapidly enlarging fibroid where let's say, you know, one year it's a certain size and then the next year or six months, it's much, much bigger. If it's rapidly enlarging and if they're also symptomatic, that would also be a reason to want to go ahead and remove it. But, you know, whether or not you perform surgical management really depends on really the symptoms and of course the patient preference as well. Thank you so much. So I'm just trying to um, okay, so yeah, so if I have an 18 week size side fibroid, right, would it be okay to attempt a hysteroscopy saying I can oscillate and do all of that? Can I, can I, if I'm skilled enough, is it something that should be attempted at all? So I get it. So you're asking about the upper limit. Well, yes. I'll say that and most times as well. So because of fibroids also don't typically grow to be 18 centimeters, right? Because most people that have, let's say somebody has an 18 centimeter, 18 week size uterus. Typically what happens is that they have multiple fibroids where there's some that could be intramural, some that could be submucosal. So um, it depends on, so if it's a purely submucosal fibroid, just because given the size of the uterine cavity, it's also very unlikely that it would grow because if it's 18 centimeter, it would, that's going to take up the entire, you know, endometrium anyway. So but if it's you're, you're right where particularly if you're worried about a really big fiber that's so mucosal that is actually where your additional imaging could actually be helpful in helping you with surgical planning so that might be a time where you want to like think about doing a solar histogram for example where you can actually visualize the fibroid and actually get a sense of well how big is it in the neutral and is, is it going to be safe for me to remove the stomach mucosally or even think about an mri that could actually also help with surgical planning and so that if, if it's, because estroscopic removal, you're gonna be using energy um, and you also wanna be careful about um, not causing complications from um, like from perforating the uterus with that energy source. And if you have a fiber that takes, that takes the entire cavity and if it's hard for you to manipulate the, the, the loop, the estroscopic loop, then you need to be recommended. So all of these discussions are based on further evaluation, based on you know the surgeon's um the surgeon's uh clinical judgment but also based on the particular clinical scenario like there's no one answer fits all it depends on the particular patient scenario